Today, it's all about paparazzi. This is Behind the Shot. Hi, once again, welcome to Behind the Shot. I'm Steve Brazel, your host, and this is the show where we try and get inside the mind of great photographers by taking a closer look behind one of their shots from conception to completion and all the stories and challenges that happen in between. Quick reminder for you, if you want to subscribe to Behind the Shot, just go to the website. It's BehindTheShot.tv. All the links are there as well. All the episodes are there for video. If you are subscribing in a podcast app, be aware that this show is available in two different forms. You can do the audio only version if you prefer. That's easy. That can be done in any podcast app, or there is an actual video version of the podcast, assuming that your podcast app does support video. And of course, if your podcast app doesn't, the videos are up on the YouTube channel at Behind the Shot as well. Quick reminder, one last thing before I bring my guest in, and that is the critique shows that I do with Don Komarechka. We do those early in the month, once a month so far. And if you want to get in on that, just head on over to Flickr, Join the Behind the Shot Flickr group and submit your images to the Flickr group there. I will not uh, put them in the pool that we draw from for critiques unless I know you explicitly want it critiqued. And the way to do that is add the Flickr tag. Be aware Flickr has their own tags. It's not a hashtag. Add the Flickr tag, BTS Critique. That puts it in the pool that we choose from. And now we've started bringing in Don and I, a third person each show. We've had uh, Troy Miller. We've had Don Comer. Uh, I'm sorry. We've had uh, David Bergman. We just had Ant Pruitt of This Week in Tech and does hands-on photography podcast. And uh, we'll have a special guest each and every episode, probably from here on out. And now I want to get into the title. So I started this out by saying, today it's all about paparazzi. What I mean by that? is the life of photographing dogs. My guest today, Kaylee Greer. Kaylee, how are you? Hi, I'm so good. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Believe me, the pleasure is all mine. You are based in and around New England. You're Providence, Boston, that type of area, yeah, right? You got it. Yeah. So um, all my you know, marketing materials and my website and everything that you probably would read about me will say I'm based in Boston. And I was when I first started the business about 10 years ago. But then like maybe about seven years ago, I moved here to just outside of Providence. So still in this, it's just about an hour drive. No big deal, right? To get back up to Boston. So um, I know people the who general live, area. I know people who live in, in Providence, but they work in Boston for Boston Public Radio and stuff. So yeah, and it's a beautiful oh, yeah. area. My family originally, both my parents are from Newport, Rhode Island. If you've never been there, people, you need to go to Newport and do something called 10 Mile Drive. The mansions will blow your mind. But I guess my question is, does that mean you work all over New England? Yeah, um, we shoot all for private clients all over New England. And I mean, actually all over the country, really, we're, we're constantly traveling. I mean, take this year out of the equation <laughs> in terms of traveling um, restrictions. Uh, so the 2020 was sort of, you know, canceled when the wheels fell off the world. But um, other than that, we travel quite a lot. So we do shoot all over New England, Boston, uh, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New Hampshire, Maine. Um, but then we're, we're a lot, uh, pretty quite often on the West coast, pretty quite often. What a weird thing to say. <laughs> it's okay. And you know, what's funny is I, that just went right by me. Like I talked like that. I'm good. It's so fancy. It's just a fancy way to say I'm often on the other coast. Um, and also internationally, I travel a lot, um, internationally. So I was supposed to be overseas this year, uh, for probably about half the year. We had lots of trips and shoots and workshops planned, but um, such is the way of the world and that's okay. We'll, we'll pick it all up again, hopefully next year. But um, yeah, so the, the short answer is we're based in Boston. We shoot a lot around here, but we also shoot a lot everywhere. Well, and the company is Dog Breath Photography, but you do, here's one of the things, like a lot of photographers, commercial photographers and stuff like that, you do private stuff, but you do commercial stuff. You work for a lot of companies. We'll mention those, uh, some of those at least, the list is too long to go through all of them, but we'll mention some of those coming up in just a minute. But I do want to mention one thing that I found really fascinating. Uh, I'm sitting at Photoshop World 2019 in Las Vegas, and the opening night of Photoshop World, they had this like meet and greet thing in a bar that was in, in uh, the hotel that we were in, which was Mirage. And I'm talking to a buddy of mine, Dustin Jack and his brother. Dustin is a live music photographer. He does a lot of behind the scenes stuff for people like Motley Crue, uh, Zach Wilde, that type of thing. Black Label Society, stuff like that. And you walk up 
with your hair, the color that it is. <laughs> and literally before he introduced me to you, because he's a mutual friend of ours, Dustin's first words to me were, you need to get her on your show. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. And then I saw what you shoot. Um, how long have you known Dustin? I've known Dustin for um, not long enough, man. He's such a he's such a special, incredibly talented and humble person and artist. Um, but I think it's been about three years now. And just in that short time, we've really gotten to know each other quite well as artists. And um, anytime I'm out in L.A. Um, or, or he's, you know, towards this coast, we try to get together. Um, I actually had a gallery showing last year in, in Los Angeles and he came out to it and I didn't know that he was going to show up and I just saw his his face turn up um, at this this little like dog breath photography gallery showing that was happening and it was just so wonderful to be supported um, so so deeply by you know another artist and another person who like gets the struggle <laughs> you know well and he's he we were talking in the green room about this but and and he may or may not hear this. Dustin is one of the most humble human beings you will ever meet and an amazing photographer. And by the way, if you want to check out his work, it's DustinJackPhotography.com. Go check him out. Give him some love. So let's talk about your clients because this was an interesting one to me. I have always loved dogs. I, I had a Husky for a number of years. And when I started looking at your client list, their names, any pet owner would know. Bark. Nat Geo Wild, Dogs Today, Huff Post, uh, Digital Photographer, Board Panda, the list goes on and on. When when you started getting into, you know, pet photography or dog photography, you do cats and stuff too, but how did that transition to such large commercial clients? That part was completely unplanned, <laughs> as, as was this entire weird, wild adventure that I've been on. Um, it it was something that just sort of happened and came by you sort of the wayside. I think when you're out there and you're chasing your dreams with like quite a fervor and such a passion um, and you're shooting things from your heart and you're not necessarily worried about getting paid or, you know, kind of what kind of money it's going to bring you or that you could, could you feasibly build a business off of this? That's how I started like shoot, photographing shelter. I try not to use the word shooting, <laughs> photographing shelter <Right>. dogs. <laughs> and, um, that's that stuff just kind of started to happen organically. Um, these offers began to kind of roll in after a few years. You know, it was a few years of me photographing shelter dogs, which kind of transitioned into private clients and people in the Boston area kind of seeing what I was doing and say, hey, are you for hire? You know, could it, could you do my dog or my sister's dog or whatever? Um, and then that kind of turned into a small boutique pet photography business. And then from there is where it kind of rolled into. Then suddenly I was getting a bit of attention from, you know, at first, you know, medium, sm small to medium sized brands. And then eventually, um, you know, led to getting an email from, you know, Dogs Well, which is a really big dog food company based out there in uh, your area right. in San Diego. And then also, you know, after that, it was uh, Purina and Pedigree. And I think they just kind of. The power of the internet is so incredible and so beautiful and so endless. And I think that's part of it, too, is I happen to be at the absolute perfect time in history to be a dog photographer because everything you put online goes can be shared in so many places and can potentially has so much potential for virality. You know what I mean? Right. Especially because it's dogs. It's the best thing in the whole world that I could be photographing in terms of shareability. So I think that's just kind of how it all spiraled through, through social media and through the internet. Um, and it's been a wild ride. <laughs> well, and I mean, top of the top of your game, the, the people that you're shooting for are big, big companies and you've been in calendars and greeting cards and packaging and ad campaigns. And you mentioned, you know, shelter dogs, photographing shelter dogs. Your background is interesting though. University of Tampa. I researched mm -hmm. you visual arts and communication <laughs> major. Yeah. And that led you into photographing landscapes, architecture, and portraits. Uh -huh. So the, the reason I bring this up, okay, there's two reasons actually. So first of all, Going from a visual arts and communications major to photography, okay, totally makes sense. Sure, yeah. <laughs> but but the, the place you started, landscapes, architecture, and portraits, uh, you know, with the exception kind of of architecture, but not really, I still see in your work, right? When you photograph your animals, 
they are landscape shots. And in landscape photography, you'll hear the the phrase a lot of times, you need a foreground subject, a midground subject, a background mm. subject. And that's where the animals come in, in what is effectively a landscape shot often. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They're portraits. They're just happen to be animals instead of humans. <laughs> and your composition, I see architecture photography in it. Do you do you see your education in your work? You know, that is that is such a, a, an amazing question. And um, I am so humbled by that, actually, that all that that you just had to say, I feel like I could cry. That's so sweet. <laughs> um, because honestly, I, I get so inside my own head when I'm like creating these shots that I don't think I, I it's funny, I get inside my head, yet it comes so naturally. And it's like a feeling I have, and I just want to keep shooting. And it's about the spirit of this dog and their story and their soul. And so I don't consciously, I don't think I consciously like do these things or put these things in there in, in such a way where you can then look at my work and see like a pattern of these things happening. Like you could probably um, pull, you know, five or six of my photos and, and put them in a row and they might have, you know, elements about them that are reflected in, in each other. And that's really cool. It's really cool to hear you say that, especially from someone who looks at so much photography and is a photographer himself. And, you know, I, do, do you I not? Really but don't you that. see it, too? I mean, uh, if you remove yourself for, for a minute, which is tough yeah, sometimes, yeah. right? Because like you <laughs> say, is. I think so. We get we get caught up in the fact that we see all thousand pictures that we take. But for yeah. other people, we only see the yeah. three pictures they post online. Exactly but, right. Yes. But your to me, at least, your background shows in your work. I looked up some of your stuff for uh, pedigree and uh, canine royalty, and and you did stuff actually for Miller's Labs too, which is not pet mm-hmm. related whatsoever. But yeah, you know, print house, print lab. You have a quote on your about page. By the way, your about mm-hmm. page is really cool too, which I dig. Oh, thanks. <laughs> but you have a quote on your about page <laughs> that I think is just one of the coolest things. It is my personal belief that there is more happiness glittering in the iris of a smiling puppy than there is anywhere else in the world. High five. (laughs) That is awesome. Thank you. High five received on the other coast of the United States. Thank you. (laughs) Exactly. The the internet. It's an amazing um, thing. Yeah. I, I think that's what's what it is for me. And I guess like before, when I was talking about that, just sort of getting out there into the world and shooting and making these things that I love so much and telling the stories of these dogs that I love so much that's kind of how all those other opportunities came rolling in. But what you just said right there is at the essence of it all. That's at the core of everything. It's, it's this, uh, this, this love that I have for these, these animals that we share our lives with, especially dogs. I've always been what I like to call a crazy dog lady, you know? Um, And I, I think that that's kind of what I'm chasing all the time, you know, in my photos is like, the love that I have for these animals that has fueled me ever since I was five years old, I would run wiling, you know, across the street towards any, any dog I would see so I could love them and pat them and squeal with delight. Um, it's still kind of what fuels me deep down inside. And so, um, it's, it's really cool to hear, you know, that you, you recognize that and you notice that in my work. I think that's the most important thing when you're telling a story in a still image, you have one single right. still frame just to, it's not a moving video. It's not, you know, it's like you have one tiny moment to capture somebody's attention and to tell a story in an instant glance. And so that's what it's really all about. And, and and to me, that's part of the beauty and challenge of it, right, is that you are capturing that one moment in time and trying to tell trying to tell a story from a frozen scene that mm-hmm. you didn't necessarily, and especially in the case of, of me with rock stars on stage or with you of, you know, animals that are in front of you, it can be difficult to tell that scene. You, they mm-hmm. actually, for a period of time, you even had a TV show on Nat Geo Wild called Paparazzi, which correct me if I'm wrong, it was basically following your life, right? Yeah. Yeah. So basically it was just kind of um, following what I do anyway, sort of on a, on a daily basis, uh, photographing shelter dogs and doing the best they, that I can just, just to speak to exactly what we're talking about uh, of, t- of selling them and telling their story in a single photo that can hopefully change their fate forever. And we can right. put it online and we can, and we can capture someone's eye and we can say, Hey, this dog who's been here behind the bars of this cage for two, sometimes three, four years with no interest, with nobody that wants to bring him 
home and call them their own. Maybe we can take one photo and we can challenge ourselves to say we can we can change somebody's mind with this photo and we can change this right. dog's life and we can change the ending to his story. So that's what the show was really based on. Um, every episode we would go and find the shelter dog that had a really incredible history, you know, and, and also a hard history and one that this dog deserved a break, you know, and uh, we would do a really special shoot and go sort of over the top. We would hike mountains with them and take them. We took one to um, an airport and did our photo with a, with an airplane. Um, I saw those. Pretty cool. Yeah. Oh, that was, it was really cool. And then we also had that like B and C storylines, which were like uh, one of them would be like a private client or a really like a personal passion project of mine. And then the third one would be a commercial job. So you could kind of come along and see behind the scenes with me uh you know what it's like to shoot behind the scenes on a dog branded sort of photo shoot so we did um we did a, sh- a shoot for earth rated which is actually a dog poop bag company <laughs> so we had hey, to get like really, ads too. <laughs> that's right that's right so we had to get creative with you know the product and not take ourselves too seriously and do some um really fun shots with sense of humor you know to sell that sell the poop bags and then we had to do um we did one for what, what was the book uh, everybody poops <laughs> That's yeah. right. I mean, there's there's a you have a. <laughs> am I correct? Coming to Amazon, I think it's November. Do you still have the book coming out? Dogtography. Yeah, yeah. Actually, so it's funny you mentioned that. Just before we got on this call, I um we had to go through the final version of like the final layout before it goes off to press. It's going to press on Monday, and I can't believe it. It's crazy. And of course, I'm scouring every single page. Like, oh my gosh, what did I say here? Oh, am I going to regret this forever? Oh, should I change this photo out? Yeah. Oh, it's should in I print. see You're stuck with it now. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly right. So it's it's been amazing and stressful and overwhelming and w- like a total adventure. I've been writing it since last year, like last fall is when I really started like heavily getting into the writing on it. And then I turned in the manuscript in April. But since April, it's been just total like layout back and forth photo CMYK conversions, which is all nightmare. But anyway, all that boring stuff aside, the good news is <laughs> the light at the end of the tunnel can be seen and it is coming out. Um, the Everything with COVID kind of changed timelines a little bit, right. but I'm really grateful that it's still coming out this year. It's coming out up sometime the first week of December. So it should be okay. like right in time for Christmas. You know, hopefully it'll be a good gift for people who know, it'll be on you know Amazon, other people. Though. Yeah, it'll be on Amazon, it'll be in Barnes & Noble, it'll be wherever books are sold, wherever physical bookstores or Amazon. But you can actually pre-order it on Amazon right now. Um, It's called Dogtography. It's really easy to find. I love the subtitle part. A Knock knock Your your Socks socks Off off Guide to Capturing the Best Dog Photos on Earth. (laughs) See, this, this, my friend, is why you're good at what you do. Is It shows, that subtitle shows you, Right. That's your attitude towards, I hit my microphone. I'm too excited. That attitude (laughs) shows um, um, how you approach this stuff and you teach. Mm -hmm. You've got workshops. It's Mm -hmm. petphotographyretreats.com. And those are group ones? Yeah. So I teach those pet photography workshops with uh, two incredibly talented pet photographers. Aside from myself, there is Charlotte Reeves um, from Brisbane, Australia, and then um, Nicole Begley, who is now living in North Carolina. (laughs) Um, But we come together in in really amazing, incredible locations all over the world and teach these, we call them once in a lifetime pet photography retreats because they're in castles and they're, um, you know, in, in exotic, amazing locations where we go to shelters and we we photograph in front of like 11th century, you know, buildings and Roman aqueducts. And it's really been wild. We've done um, six so far and they've been in places like Costa Rica and the South of France. We've done um, Australia, uh, excuse me, New Zealand. Um, I also taught a workshop in Australia, but it was a little bit unrelated. Um, And uh, we've been to, why am I forgetting Spain? We've, We've taught in Spain. So it's been a, it's been pretty bananas. It's, it's, I'm so grateful. Honestly, so it's, Steve, every second of every day, I have to pinch myself. <laughs> I have to wake up uh, right. and say, is this really happening? Because I get to hang out with dogs every day. And that's all I ever wanted. That five-year-old girl inside of me is screaming with delight. <laughs> well, and you teach for Photoshop World, we should mention too. So I, I've got questions before we get into the shot. Okay, let's Are, hear it. Do you, have a lot of competi- do you have a lot of competition? Are there a lot of you know, people specializing in this genre? When I first started 10 years ago, there were not many at all. You could count them on, on maybe one hand, 
maybe two hands uh, throughout the country, 10 or so people really like specializing um, in dog photography. Uh, and now these days it's kind of blown up. I think it's blown up because okay. it, it looks very glamorous from the outside. And, and in a way it, it is the most wonderful job on planet earth. It really is. But, um, it's, it's a hard, it's hard work. And I think a lot of people get into it and then they kind of realize that it is incredibly difficult and it's laying on your stomach in the mud and it's getting migraines from the sun and right. it's, you know, being covered in dog hair and, and muck and, um, and it's amazing and I wouldn't change it for anything, but I think, uh, there's like a high turnover rate a little bit in this industry because people come in thinking it's going to be really, really glamorous and, and they're going to hit the easy button, you know, like the staples easy button <laughs> there. Right. Um, and then suddenly they're going to be like a famous pet photographer real quick. And because it is becoming so noisy of an industry, you have to make, I mean, phenomenal, spectacular, out of this world, unique stuff that's not being made to it. Like any, that's like any genre of photography though, right? Like you have to stand it's out. Like, you have it's to like any it. genre of career. Yeah, right? exactly you, right. You exactly. have to create your own world. You have to create your own voice and you have to make your work stand out, which then begs the question, if somebody wanted to do this, is there anything unique to this genre as far as requirements? I mean, obviously you're shooting with cameras and lenses and any, anything yeah. this genre requires gear wise. Um exceptional patience that, that others that's don't not <laughs> exceptional i know that's not gear but in a way it's the the biggest skill that you could have to bring to the table for something like this is is it like so, a deep and unending love of dogs that's going to allow you to find the patience because there are times where you know it's like say for example light like you have never seen light before a sunset that is so magical it's like narnia opened up and is like shining all over planet earth and you're freaking out as a photographer you're like oh my, i'm freaking out if i was a landscape photographer i could shoot it i could sit there and i could rejoice and dance and happy dance and put on my tripod and Bloop, 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 and I got a nice right. five frames for an HDR and I could make it magical and perfect and I could have that moment. That moment could be mine. But with a dog, forget it. Dogs will say, oh, light? What's light? <laughs> I don't care about light. I don't care that everything's perfect. And if I just would look at you for one two hundredth of a second right now, you could get the best shot of your career and you could retire on this shot. I don't care. <laughs> Where's right. my treat? Yeah. <laughs> so I think you that's... um. It's, it's, it's patience and it's also dog training skills, which is um, a big one that a lot of people overlook, I think. They just want to jump into it because it seems really fun, but they don't have a deep knowledge of dogs. Those are the two things I would say for um, not physical gear, just uh, how you have to come equipped with as like a human being, which I find is uh, can be really challenging. And I have well, and, endless Well, and different patience, dogs but, are different, right? Mm -hmm, I mean, I've had, mm -hmm. I've had uh, friends with dogs that – are, you know, hyper. Mm -hmm. And then my Husky, as we took him for a walk, a dog could walk up to him and, and attack him. And he'd look at him like, dude, what are you doing? You yeah, 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 exactly. I, you know, right. Exactly. Every dog has a unique personality and every breed has certain like humans, right? They have certain traits. You have a, you have a quote on your website that I, I find interesting at a dog breath photo shoot. You won't find any cloth or paper backdrops. You won't find any sterile white studios or artificial sets. There won't be any props or forced poses. So the question is, how do you get these crazy poses out of an animal? <laughs> um, it's it's all about so so, and that that statement is sort of about like I'm not interested in the sterility of like a ma right. a made up moment. You know, I don't want to um, craft something that's not real. I want the dog to give me what a dog is going to give me. I want dogs being dogs. I want whimsy. I want magic. I want candor. I want water, mud in your eyes. I want it everywhere, you know? So um, that's kind of what that's about. And that's the lucky for me, what dogs will give you if you just let them, you know, kind of be themselves. Um, but of course I forgot your question cause I went off on a complete tangent on well, <laughs> so what do you it's just, me? how do you, you know, like the shot, well, I'll, you know what, let's do it this way. Let's okay, go let's into today's <laughs> shot because today's shot kind of, kind of sums up what I mean. Okay. And it, it, we went back and forth and, and for people who don't know the way I work shot selection is I want to pick a shot that a, I have questions about because sometimes you can have a fantastic shot, but it's like people look at it and go, okay, I know exactly what you did. It's not right. a conversation in that, right? 
but it's a great shot. I want a shot I have questions about, but I also want a shot my guest is comfortable talking about. So they, they usually send me a pool of maybe five images, six images to pick from. And we went back and forth because I'm not going to lie. I had a lot of hard time going. I, I went to your website multiple times to look at photos. You sent me photos before we settled on this one. And this is called Dobby Splash. For those of you watching or for those of you listening on audio or watching, you know, like on a mobile device, the video, you can always go to the website behind the shot TV to see this picture. There's a gallery of Kaylee's work there, other work, and all of her links are in the blog post associated with this episode. If you're watching on YouTube and you like what we're doing, please, right now is a good time. Hit subscribe, hit the bell so that you get notified with every new episode. And this is Dobby Splash. Now, this is what I'm talking about, right? How do you get, it's in a human, you'd have to look at Dobby and go, <laughs> okay, perfect, right there. Oh no, a little, your, now splash mm -hmm. the water, uh -huh. right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm guessing that didn't work here. Yeah, no, no, not at all. Um, Dobby's a dog, as we can, <laughs> as we can all uh, gather by uh, looking at this photo. He is actually, I will say though, let's give Dobby credit. He is the mo one of the single most magical dogs I've ever met and I've ever photographed. Um, and actually Dobby has sort of become like my muse. Like if I have a really big idea and I need a unicorn of a dog to try it on, Dobby's my, he's my guy. Um, the other thing about this is that Dobby has cancer and I try, I try, I'll try not to cry. He's, he's very special to me. Um, he's not my dog. I should clarify. He was a client's dog actually. And she booked me for five photo shoots. And after the fifth wow. one, yeah, after the fifth year in a row of her coming back, I said to her, I love this woman so much. And she becomes such a dear, she became such a dear friend to me. I said, okay, no more paying for photo shoots. <laughs> you don't have to book me and pay me for photo shoots anymore. Like this is like right. a business relationship. You are like a, so special to me. And this dog is so special to me. He is a therapy dog. Um, so he spends a lot of his time in hospitals and, and schools with, um, you know, like disadvantaged children. He spends time in hospices. This dog does a lot of hard and heavy work. And he's been with many people as, as they have kind of crossed you know, over that bridge to take them to wherever we go next. So he's, <laughs> he's a really, really special little soul. And uh, to see him get sick and to see him, uh, he's, he's 11 now. So, you know, naturally he's aging anyway, but he's had cancer for a couple of years on and off, but he finally just had kind of a, uh, a resurgence of two types of cancer. And so we know, you know, we're aware that we may not have, a lot of time. And when I found out about this, it was like the height I of so the lockdown. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> no, it's okay. Because that's, that's the magic that went into this photo. You know, it's the, it's the story. It's the love. It's the emotion that I feel for this dog that I feel like, um, is partly what makes this photo so special, you know, and what partly what well, makes, uh, go ahead. For sorry. people <laughs> who are listening to the audio. Let me let me describe what we're talking about here. This is just a beautiful animal. This dog looks like he just came from a hair salon. I mean, everything about him just looks like he's just been groomed, right? And he's in a river with, in the background, you see the mountains or hills. There's a valley in the middle. The light in the sky changes from the lower part of the valley up to the sky. You've got beautiful white clouds. Uh, Dobby is doing this splash and the splash spilled perfectly. I mean, like, again, <laughs> you could not have done this if the main part of that splash went across the forehead but it curves right. just sliver so slightly above the head and wraps around the other side of the head. It's like this perfect frame. It's a sheet of water that is refracting the light, but you can see through it. And, and here's the, it's super wide, by the way, I should say that the camera, you know, you know, the old portrait saying of, if you want to make somebody look really super strong, you shoot up at them. Well, the camera is like water level shooting up at Dobby and the colors the colors are rich and super vibrant and saturated, but 
Not like somebody was drunk and went nuts with a vibrance and saturation <laughs> knob, right? It's they're rich and vibrant. And yet in the way that I imagine I'm standing in the river with Dobby, that's that's the beauty of this particular shot. This was based on my understanding of the EXIF data. This was a Canon 5D Mark mm -hmm. III. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my favorite lenses, which is the mm -hmm. 16 to 35 Mark II. One two hundredth of a second makes sense there. You froze the water and yet you got the mm -hmm. sheet almost because of the sheet of water. It looks like a motion drag shutter. But it, yeah. it's not. It too, you, you see what I mean? Yeah, it, it does. It, it yeah, froze all the droplets. Yeah, yeah, you get the smoothness. F14. I'm going to get into that in a minute because that's an interesting okay. one to me. ISO 100, 16 millimeter, millimeter. Did you shoot this raw or JPEG? Raw, for sure. Yeah, always raw. Okay. So first let's hit the F14. What's your thinking? I mean, obviously this is bright daylight. By the way, the light mm -hmm. on the front of that dog, is that artificial? I got to ask that. That up is artificial. Yes. Yeah. On the front of Dobby. Yes. What is it? It's just a, a flash beauty or? dish. You no, know, it's a it's a, a pro a photo dish on a dog. Um, <laughs> it's a <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yep, it's See, a this is what photo. I'm talking about, though. <laughs> a pro photo B. Why am I forgetting B one? Uh, okay. With a so it's not a speed light dish. or something. It's a it's no, a it's a pretty strobe. legit strobe. strobe. Yeah, actually a very legit. Why F14? <laughs> what were you trying to ensure? by going F14? A couple of things, but mostly the biggest factor is the sky, is the ambient light in the atmosphere. It's what is the sky doing and giving me, and is the sky interesting? And if it is, inter if it is interesting, how do I preserve the, the detail and the, the basically the, the file data in the sky? Because it's so easy to lose a sky and so easy to blow out a sky and to, and to lose all the information in it. So I wanted to stop down as much as I could. So, you know, increase my aperture number, um, you know, so as, as sometimes I'm all the way up at F22. It really depends um, on the ambient light in the sky. And in this case, when I arrived at F14, I really liked the exposure on the landscape. Forget Dobby, forget the water. I liked the exposure okay. on the landscape and what it was doing to the sky. Then I add Dobby in and I adjust the lighting for him. Um, so basically well, F14... And, and what really I love about the 14 is... You had you gone, had you gone, you know, larger aperture, you could have blurred that background, and a lot of people naturally would want to blur the background. But it's that's the landscape thing I was talking about earlier. This is just a landscape dog, landscape dog. It's a <laughs> landscape shot <clears throat> yeah. with a dog in it. Uh, by the way, do you shoot manual? I do. Yeah. Yeah. Hundred okay. percent. Yeah. When I so first now, learned, I. Uh, Sorry, I apologize. No, go ahead. When you. you first learned That's what? like the worst thing you can do in a podcast is like talk over somebody. <laughs> I really it's, apologize. Uh, trust me. <laughs> talk over me. You, what you were yeah. going to say though when you first learned? Um, so yeah, when I first learned, when I first picked up a camera, naturally my instinct was to click it onto the green mode, you know, and just be like, D click, done. You know, now I know how to, how to photograph uh, dogs and I know how to use a camera. So let me move on. But I had to force Key myself for to say- I have to take it. That's right. I have to do this manually for so many reasons, but especially with dogs because they move so fast. I can't allow myself to make that mistake of having a moment like this, for example, that I can never, ever recreate again. No, as long as I live and no matter how hard I try, it's just one of those serendipitous moments of magic that if this was blurry because I happened to be at, you know, one eightieth of a second or something because the camera chose that for me. I, I right. would regret it every day that I lived. So it's it's something I had to force myself to do. So f 10 years ago when I picked up a camera after my first day in green mode and green auto mode, I decided to to never try that again. And then I just I just learned and it was a pain and it was awful and I wanted to cry, but I got through it. And now it's like a second language to me now. And it's uh, uh, if I can do it, anyone can. <laughs> what I'm really curious about, though, is is the way that you do focusing of a dog in water, because you've got a lot of competition between splash, the dog moving quickly. Do you do a single autofocus point or, you know, cannons have the ability to do a center point and what they call focus assist, where they have, you know, points around the center one? Or do you do zone autofocus? What do you choose? Usually, at I least. 
usually the great, great majority of the time I use a single focus point directly on a dog's eye and typically, you know, the closer eye <laughs> if possible. But right. in, in a case like this one with Dobby, um, you know, I do a lot of shots that really have uh, a great deal of motion in them. And it's really all about capturing this like movement. And so in this case, for example, we're throwing a ball through the frame over and over again to get Dobby to run through my frame. Um, and in, in this that's case, that's what you were doing. Yeah, <laughs> that's what's happening. You know, if you have a dog that's motivated by something wonderful, whether it's a ball or a squeaky toy or treats, you can usually get them to do repeated actions over and over again. And Dobby is like I told you, he's my muse. He's the dog I go to for all my big ideas. Um, and so I know he can do this. This is a skill that I know he has, that he can do repeatable actions and he is thrilled to do it all day long. So we're throwing a ball through the frame. So that means that there's a chance that I put the zone focus on. In this case, I would have selected the uh, the center top focus point kind of group of nine there to let the yep. camera kind of work out exactly where where to which of those nine little blinky focus points to pick in that zone. Um, just because I know his head's usually going to end up somewhere about there if I'm doing everything right. Uh, I can't say for sure if I recall if I used a single focus point on the shot or a group of. Uh, a zone in the in the middle, but um, I can probably look that up. The the interesting thing on this shot to me actually is the flat is that flash. So you can see the catch light in the eye, but here's where mm -hmm. I'm confused. You've got daylight, f14, you know ISO 100, 200th of a second, 16 millimeters, and a flash clearly lighting Dobby's face. How on earth did you not blow out the highlights in the water? They're not I'm blowing gonna, out. People, I go know, look on the what? website, BehindTheShot.tv. I'm going to call serendipity on this one. Honestly, it was not You know what I mean, though? Yeah, you're actually right. It was, I, d I will tell you that in like Lightroom, when I p processed the raw, I definitely would have toned down those highlights on the water because they, they were. But they, but, but they right, were saved, but they blown so out. the data was there. Yeah, yeah, you know, you're right. That it's just uh, Dobby and the water were both in the same kind of swath of shade. So when I'm lighting both of those things, they're getting an equal amount of illumination, I suppose, you know. Now, naturally, yes, the water is much more reflective than something like Dobby's curly brown yeah. fur, you know. So that is going to have highlights, which it does have some up by his feet for sure, and then in the water itself. And well, and I up do to, recall to the right of his down. head. Yeah. But if you look at that bright spot to the right of his head, mm -hmm. that's got blues in it and it's not clipped. And it's just seriously, the shot is technically so well executed. Even the composition, right? The dog is centered. A lot of people say, don't do your subject I, in the center. But here's the deal. I, yeah. there's, a, there's a bigger hill on the left of Dobby than on the right. And He's near the valley, but not dead center in it so that you can see the valley. You've got the water splash coming from the right hand side, exactly coming into the frame at a rule of third. Mm -hmm. Right. There's a three dimensional part to the splashes of Dobby. And here's the other thing, by the way. There's a slight warmth. The, the, the upper left corner is cool and dark mm -hmm. and the skies, but there's a warmth in the cloud area. Mm -hmm. It's just really processing wise. What do you, what, where did you learn your processing style or, or how do you do your processing style? Because clearly I mentioned earlier, the saturation and the colorful rich look is in every one of your shots. So you what's your workflow me. and what apps are you using? <laughs> First, I'll where, tell you. What's your magic one? <laughs> First of all, you humble me so much and your words are so kind. And I genuinely, I think sometimes, like I said before, you're sort of, you're out there on location and you're, you're inspired and you're motivated. This dog is so special to me, so deeply intrinsically special that I wanted to create something that was a celebration of his life. And so it was all about the, the movement and, and the, and the magic and the whimsy and the sort of uh, fairy tale that we could create starring my favorite dog on earth. Um, and so I, I didn't think very hard about the cool, uh, uh, you know, side on the left uh, and, and the warmth in the sky and the valley and where I positioned the valley. I, I have to be honest with you. Like, I wish I could be like, I'm an artistic genius and I did all this on purpose. But I think sometimes things sort of just line up and 
uh, there's something to be said for the I'm feeling. I'm sorry, but 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 success like this <laughs> may be quote unquote accidental, mm-hmm. but accidents favor the experienced. Mm. Right. I mean, yeah, let's yeah. be honest. Yeah. Part of it is you you knew where to put the camera to have the background landscape, which I still believe is your landscape background. Mm-hmm. Um, what apps do you use? So every photo uh, that I shoot is shot in raw. So naturally, I want to um, process the raw before I do anything further with it. So right, I take right, right. it into Lightroom. Um, probably pretty expected answer. Lightroom and Photoshop are, are really all I use. Um Actually, I shouldn't say that. So I'll, I'll kind of give you a brief rundown. Um, everything gets run through through Lightroom. Uh, there is where I deal with sharpness, contrast, naturally, stuff like that. Any weird color casts or anything that might happen. Um, nothing okay. nothing major. I don't do anything too major in Lightroom. What I do do, for example, though, is deal with those highlights, uh, deal with the shadows. The shadows, especially on things in the background um, where the light is not hitting, say things that are mid range, right? So I've exposed for the sky and I've kind of taken into account the mountains really far away, but I haven't necessarily taken into account in this image, for example, that rock that happens halfway between Dobby and the mountains in the background. Right. So that rock would be a little bit lit by the ambient. You can see that the face of it is catching the sun. And by the way, uh, it's warm on the right because it's a sunset. Uh, it's just starting. It's like an early sunset. So you get that as soon as the sun gets closer to the earth, you get a warmer color out of it. It has something to do with physics. I won't get into it. <laughs> but so we get that warmth on that side. But that rock otherwise would be pretty dark, almost black. Now, here's where my gear comes into play, because um, lately I've been shooting. Now, I did not shoot this image with with the camera I'm about to talk about, but I, I did... Um, I did get uh, a Canon 1DX Mark III when they came out in February, Ooh. and it has dynamic range like uh, it like a boss. It is like a savior of a camera for for someone like me who's like obsessed with dynamic range and is going for the brightest brights and the darkest darks I can possibly get in an image. It is use the unbelievable. histogram, the whole histogram. It's, yeah, the whole thing. I want to fill it up with so much detail and um, and interest, and I want to pull from the shadows later. Typically, so in this, for example, what I was getting at is I'll take this into Lightroom and I'll lift the shadows plus 50 to on the rock, for example, and paint in the detail back into the rock because it's likely going to be pretty dark since the light is not hitting it, you know? Um, so right. this was shot with a, the reason this was shot with a Canon uh, uh, 5D Mark III, which is the oldest camera I have, is because I was shooting this with an underwater housing and the only camera that fits physically oh. into my underwater housing is uh, my 5D Mark III. So this was shot with an Ike Light underwater housing. And uh, the reason that we were at this location was because this is like some of the clearest water in New England. It's in uh, it's the Pemigewasset River. Where is River. this? It's in Lincoln, New Hampshire. Okay. Um, so it's by Loon Mountain, like where people go skiing. I mean, this river runs the entirety of New Hampshire. But this is the spot we went to where it was exceptionally clear. Um, and so it's it's like you know, glacial runoff. So it is ice cold and it, I shouldn't say glacial, it's mountain runoff. I don't know that we have glaciers <laughs> over here in New Hampshire. Dobby doesn't seem to be bothered Dobby by the temperature mind, but whatsoever. It is, no, it's, it was cold and it was May. So it was still kind of warming up, you know, uh, from a long winter. Uh, but anyway, we were there because the intention was to do half underwater, half above water photos. And actually I did get a number of beautiful ones that day. Um, But in this case, my attempt was to go half underwater. And sometimes it just doesn't work out, like whether you don't submerge the camera enough or um, the water's flowing in in a certain way where it kind of bunches up on the front of the the big dome that you have. It kind of doesn't really show you the half underwater bit. And so when I got this on the back of my camera, I thought, oh, my goodness, this is so magical. And this is so once in a lifetime. But it's, of course, naturally, as a photographer, I'm like, womp, womp. It's not half underwater, though, you know, which is what I came here for. So at first, I didn't consider it such a success. And then after looking at it for a while. That's why you don't delete pictures in camera either. (laughs) Oh, never. I'm a photo hoarder. I'm a proper hoarder. So I would never. Um, But I took it home and, you know, looked at it later. And I thought, you know what? Uh, whether or not I've got the half underwater, this is so special to me. And this is, this is a remarkable moment with this splash. Um, yeah. So if you want to know more secrets about this photo, the secret behind the splash is that I was uh, throwing his ball. Well, I wasn't uh, naturally, I was sitting in the water with him um, with the camera and the 
the with the housing on it half underwater and his his mom joy and my fiance sam were helping and they were throwing the ball for him towards me they kept throwing it towards me so that he would run right at me and i'd get the splash and i'd get the underwater and i'd get everything well i kept noticing that the ball every time it would land right in front of my camera it would make this spectacular splash it was so beautiful and the way the light caught it it was just I was so inspired and I was freaking out and I was like, my heart was beating so fast because I was, this is magical. This is exactly what I want. The problem was when they were throwing the ball directly at my face <laughs> to get Dobby to come directly towards me, the splash was then every time obscuring Dobby's face. So it was splashing and blunt and going everywhere and it was magical. But the problem was Dobby's little furry head was just barely sticking out from behind it. So naturally the shot yep. didn't mean anything to me without, without him. So I thought, well, God, this looks so beautiful. How can we do this? How can we create a splash that's not going to be in my way, but still get him to chase the ball towards me? So I had, I, I altered things a little and I had Sam throw the ball instead of right in front. So to where it would land in the water, right in front of my, my viewfinder and end up obscuring Dobby. I had him throw it just slightly to the left of me. So Dobby would almost pass me just barely by a few inches. And that's why in this photo, it's actually not really trademark of me to have a photo where a dog isn't making direct eye contact attacked with the camera. That's a big thing for me typically. But um, in this in this photo, I decided to kind of go outside of my comfort zone and try something a bit different. So because you can see if you look at the photo, he's looking off to the left just a bit and he's in search of something. And what he's in search of is the ball. He's on his way to the ball. So instead of of the ball creating the splash, I said, well, shoot. We've got to create a splash, but we don't want it to obscure him. So maybe Joy, while Sam throws the ball at me, this is a three ring circus. <laughs> while Sam throws the ball at me and Dobby chases the ball, can Joy, can you splash the water off frame and, and, and splash it in such a way where it kind of like uh, makes an arc? Not that she can control that, but can you practice a couple splashes and see if you can potentially get that splash to come into my frame and be big and, and kind of go towards Dobby? Now, I never thought in a million years it would like arc over him so perfectly. I thought it would just kind of come in perfect. and I never thought it would. I was so proud of her. I was like, Joy, you made me the most perfect splash. So basically what happened is Dobby's running after his ball, slightly off camera to the left towards me. And I'm shooting really wide and low. And I have my, my camera in the water, which is why the angle is so low, because I have a housing on it. So it can be in the water, touching the pebbles, right. tilted up. And then she's splashing at exactly the same time that he's running. And she's just off camera, um, just barely. I think her like her fingertip was like on the edge of this frame and I cropped it out because you could see her fingertip. You know what I mean? Oh. Um, so that's really the, the mayhem behind the magic here <laughs> is there's a lot going on. Well. And we had to try about 100 times. Seriously, probably about 100 times. Um, and because Dobby has cancer and he's, you know, He's doing great for his diagnosis, but he is not perfectly well. I wanted to make sure I didn't totally tire him out, so we had to take lots of breaks and take it easy with him. Um, it was it was a big day. It was a big, long day. It was like four hours in the water, and we all just kind of tried to enjoy it and bring snacks and make a day of it, and And this was the photo that came out of it. So it's, that's... It is, it is so well done. And again, the color just... Do you, are you getting these colors in Lightroom or in Photoshop mostly, that, so, that richness? Yeah, the actual uh, – the answer to that really genuinely is mostly it's in camera. And that's because – Nice. I say that because I, I stop down the ambient light enough so that I can expose for the richness in the sky. And sometimes I go right. even further than just exposing for the sky. I will go further. I will darken the sky a little extra because that fills it with color. It's really saturated when it's kind of yeah. underexposed. Um, as you know, you take your iPhone out at any good sunset and you, you know, you kind of point it towards the sunset. And if you tap on the screen and you drag the little sun down and you make it just slightly darker – you, you make a real spectacular Colors sunset pop. that's a little extra, yeah. you know, it's a little extra. So that I do that in camera, but then naturally, for sure, once this goes through Lightroom and it gets its sharpening and its shadows and all that, then I take it into Photoshop and I will do um, leash removal, stuff like that. Dobby didn't have a leash on. Actually, he doesn't even have a collar on because he's my unicorn. Of st he's my magical unicorn. But most dogs, it's leash removal. Um, sometimes they have like the county tags or whatever, you know, so I have to remove that stuff. But it's eye sharpening. That's a really big one. Eye sharpening and then adding some like extra texture into Dobby. 
Um, cause especially when a dog is wet, they have the most beautiful texture and he's a curly brown poodle. So he's like velvet curls that, um, that just looks so good with a little extra texture. So when you asked me before, if I use, um, what other kind of software I use, I, I should mention, I use Nick color effects pro quite a bit. I love, love color effects pro. I love it. And I yep. use, tonal I love contrast. pro contrast, which is in yep. color effects pro and yep. also tonal contrast. Yep. Uh, are so just total contrast ama- looks Seriously. amazing. It looks amazing in fur, uh, especially in dogs' fur, and, and especially extra, especially when they're wet. So uh, it, that's what I used here to just kind of really bring out the texture and the detail in his fur. And the other thing is because he's going through chemo, um, it, he he looks quite different in this photo than he looks on a on a daily basis. He's very fluffy typically and very very hairy. In fact. I usually can't get his eyes in a shot because he's got so much fur and she keeps him like really long um, and kind of doodly, like labradoodly, like very long. Uh, and he has a mohawk usually. You can kind of see the remnants of his mohawk here because uh, all the children that he goes to visit in the hospitals, they really love his like he usually has a green mohawk or something cool like that. Um but again, because of the cancer, his hair looks a little different and his face is quite bald compared to how he normally looks. So the space that's in between his eyes um, is really pretty bald in this shot. So I did fill it in a little bit, like with a deeper brown, just so he didn't look sick because this was his celebration of life. I didn't want Joy, his mom or his, you know, his owner there or anybody to look at this and think that dog looks sick. You know what I mean? I wanted, I wanted to celebrate the moment and how he felt in that moment and the magic of life and what he's brought to the world. So that's, that's kind of a little tweak that I did just to make sure he didn't look unwell. Um, I don't want that, the story to be about that, you know? So, um, but that, that's kind of it really. And then, and then the colors get, um, you know, uh, definitely I add a little bit of vibrance and stuff like that, but it's mostly, texture that i work on in photoshop it's just i mean first of all your entire portfolio is addicting to look at especially (laughs) if you're an animal lover (laughs) thank you but this shot is so good i want to remind people about your book which they can pre-order now dogtography a knock your socks off guide to capturing the best dog photos on (laughs) earth by kaylee greer you can find that to pre-order it on amazon and uh, I want to cover your websites really quick. Your website yeah. is dogbreathphoto.com. Mm-hmm. Facebook and Twitter, uh, Dog Breath Photo. You got it. Yep. And Instagram, Dog Breath Photography, correct? Y- yep. Instagram. And Instagram is one of it where I've been really, really active. I'm trying to always update my stories and show behind the scenes from my shoots and kind of show how I do certain things and, and how I use treats to get dogs to look at me and all kinds of cool stuff. Um, I find it a really good platform for that kind of thing. So if you're going to um, seek me out anywhere, definitely look on Instagram because uh, I try to let you in on all the little weird bits of life as a dog photographer there. <laughs> and then you also do your retreats. Mm-hmm. PetPhotographyRetreats.com. Yep, you got it. So and... we're... No, Sorry, go ahead. I interrupted you. <laughs> no, so, no, no, uh, don't we... apologize. That's fine. <laughs> we There's internet to be... lag. That's the world. <laughs> I know that. That's the truth, isn't it? We were supposed to be in Scotland uh, teaching this year and then in Spain this year. So those both have been moved to next year. Um I want to say they, well, Scotland is definitely sold out. Spain might be sold out, but it's worth looking on the website just to to double check. Um, But we do those amazing overseas international retreats in fabulous locations a couple times a year. And then there may even be some local stuff starting to crop up. I, uh, I'm hoping to do some more workshops here in the U.S. I never really have done too many um, besides uh, the Photoshop world stuff that I do for Kelby One. I'm a Kelby One instructor, so you can find classes by me um, on KelbyOne.com. I have four classes on there. Um, and then I teach at Photoshop world and I speak at conventions, but I've never really done a proper in-person workshop in the U S yet. So I'm working on it. Um, so hopefully you can find that information as well over my website. Eventually. Well, fingers crossed. It's a weird year, (laughs) but (laughs) yeah, yeah. It's a bizarre year. So I have one last question before we go. Yeah, let's hear it. Uh, and then we're going to let people go discover this name one photographer that people need to know about, and then people can go look him up. He or she. Okay, uh, you need to you need to look up uh, Elka 
Vogelsung. I hope I'm saying that right. Elka Vogelsung. Elka I'll spell Vogelsung. It. She is absolutely phenomenal. I don't know if I should tell you what it is or if it'll be a spoiler, but I mean, naturally, if you know anything Let about me. Let people be what, surprised. Yeah. All right. Go be surprised. You know you know what I like, <laughs> so you won't be surprised by the subject so, matter. So how do you spell it? E-L-K-E, Elka, uh, and then Vogelsung, V-O-G-E-L-S-A-N-G, as far as I know. Um, I believe she's German, so it's a, it's a bit of a doozy on the spelling, okay. um, but she is... I shouldn't say that about someone's name. I'm sure to her it's completely regular and normal. Of course it is. She is a uh, wonderful, incredibly talented, and so kind. And that means a lot in this industry. Um, you know, kindness. Kindness is really important, and kindness matters. And I think um, some people can be a little tough to deal with in this industry <laughs> from time to time. So oh, yeah. that's, that's a big one for me. You you will love this woman's work um, if you want to spend a couple hours, waste a couple hours, just like just delightfully squealing at your computer, then go look at her. So there's a good surprise. Go look her <laughs> up. And uh, Kaylee Greer, dogbreathphoto.com again. And if you talk to Dustin before me, tell him I said hi. I will. But <laughs> thank you so much for doing this. I have thoroughly enjoyed our talk. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. It's, uh, it's, it's special to be able to kind of dive in with another artist who understands and be able to... Um, break it all down and and thank you again for your kind words and thanks everybody for listening <laughs> it, it's it's my pleasure and to everybody you can see uh obviously more of her work at her website but on the website behind the shot.tv you'll find a little bit that i wrote about kaylee and there's a small gallery of her work there and links to her website and all of her social media uh, her workshops all of that type stuff again you can subscribe to this podcast all the links or at the website behindtheshot.tv. You can do so in whatever your favorite podcast catcher app is, in either an audio-only format or a video format. The videos are also up on the YouTube channel at Behind the Shot on YouTube. If you like what you're seeing on YouTube, please drop a thumbs up, subscribe, click the bell, give us a little love there. It is much, much appreciated. And same in your podcast app or iTunes or wherever. Drop us a review, drop us you know whatever you think. Just be honest. Uh, I appreciate any and all feedback. To everybody, thanks so much for watching. I'm Steve Brazel. This is Behind the Shot, the show where we try and get inside the mind of great photographers like Kaylee by taking a closer look behind one of their shots. We'll see you on the next show.